Let's talk caffeine. What is caffeine and how does it work? Is it good or bad for you? And finally, what is the best caffeinated beverage to consume for productivity and health? And I think you already know the answer to that. What's going on guys? For those of you who are new here, my name is Kevin Jabal, physician entrepreneur based in Las Vegas, formerly in plastic surgery. So what is caffeine and how does it work in the body? Caffeine is a stimulant and it is of the methyl xanthine class. So you drink some caffeinated beverage or you take your caffeine pill and it gets quickly absorbed by the small intestine in your gut. From the small intestine, it passes through the portal circulation and then to the rest of the body. And once it gets passed to the rest of the body, it gets into just about every single tissue there is. So it passes obviously the BBB, also known as the blood brain barrier. That's how it gives you that psychoactive you know, effect. It also passes the blood placenta barrier as well as the blood testes barrier. It gets everywhere. Caffeine is primarily metabolized and broken down in the liver by a specific enzyme called cytochrome P450-1A2, also known as CYP1A2 for short. Now each of us could have a different genotype encoding for that enzyme and even one single base pair being different, a single nucleotide polymorphism or a SNP is what we call it, can actually change our rate of metabolism of caffeine. So if you remember from high school biology, you know, the adenosine, you know, the A, the G, the C, the T, changing one of those can actually change your overall metabolism of caffeine. This explains why some people can have caffeine at 9 p.m. and sleep like a baby, and other people like me, if I drink caffeine too late at night, my sleep is jacked. This is going to affect your metabolism of caffeine. And generally speaking, it's anywhere from two to 12 hours in terms of half-life. That means if you have a full dose of caffeine, now keep in mind, your blood caffeine concentration will rise around 30 to 60 minutes after ingestion. The half-life means when will the concentration in your blood decrease by 50%? And that again is between two and 12 hours, but the average is roughly five hours. So how does caffeine actually work in the brain? It works by competitive inhibition at the adenosine receptor. So what that means is, there's this substance called adenosine that builds up in our brains and it increases over the course of the day when you sleep it resets so as it builds up over the course of the day that's telling your brain hey we're getting tired we're getting more sleepy caffeine binds to those same receptors such that adenosine can't bind to them instead but it doesn't activate the receptors to then tell your brain that you're tired so it blocks the adenosine from telling your brain that you're becoming tired caffeine's action at these adenosine receptors is going to indirectly influence the release of other neurotransmitters in the brain other neurotransmitters like dopamine or norepinephrine or acetylcholine, serotonin, glutamate, GABA. And these are going to influence your mood, your alertness, your cognition, ability to focus, all those things. One of the main adenosine receptors that caffeine acts on is the A2A receptor, also known as the Adora 2A receptor. So depending on your genetic variation of this receptor of you know the gene that, that codes for this receptor rather, you can have different levels of caffeine sensitivity, which is why some people will get a greater effect of caffeine versus others. If your heart has ever felt different after you consume some caffeine, it's actually because caffeine also acts on cardiac adenosine receptors. In short, it has a positive chronotropic, which means that it increases the heart rate, and positive inotropic, meaning that each contraction is now stronger and harder and can overall increase the risk of arrhythmias. Now at higher doses, caffeine is going to inhibit phosphodiesterases in the heart, and that's Going to induce activation of beta-1 receptors. What the f does that mean? What this translates to is positive chronotropic and inotropic effects in the heart, which increase the risk for arrhythmias. So positive chronotropic means the heart is beating faster, and positive inotropic means that the heart is contracting harder with each contraction. All right, next up. Is caffeine good or bad for you? We know that caffeine improves memory, alertness, and mood, and taken before a workout, convert to placebo, it definitely improves performance. Caffeine consumption has also been linked to lower rates of various neurodegenerative diseases like Parkinson's and Alzheimer's. Because of caffeine's antagonistic effect at these adenosine receptors, it actually causes blood vessel constriction. Vasoconstriction is what we call it. And that helps it in the treatment of headaches. So a few headache medications actually use caffeine as part of their ingredient list. So Excedrin, for example, is acetaminophen plus caffeine, and Furoset is acetaminophen plus caffeine plus butalbital. But it isn't all good. Caffeine can sometimes be bad for you. You can build caffeine dependence and then have caffeine withdrawals if you are a regular user. Low caffeine users are below 200 milligrams per day, moderate are between 200 and 400 milligrams per day, and then those high caffeine consumers are over 400 milligrams per day. The more caffeine you use on a more regular basis, the more likely you are to have caffeine withdrawal. And the withdrawal is going to affect things like headache, mood, your energy levels. It's not fun, trust me. And caffeine intoxication can occur even with a single dose that is 200 milligrams or greater. Symptoms are gonna include things like anxiety, insomnia, GI upset, muscle twitching, restlessness. And one that I found a little bit amusing is 
periods of inexhaustibility. Acute consumption of higher doses, we're talking 500 milligrams, 600 milligrams, or even higher, can cause tremor, anxiety, arrhythmias, and even death. And if you do have some additives with your caffeine, depending on what drink you use to consume it, things like guarana from energy drinks or alcohol from various cocktails can actually potentiate the effects of caffeine. That means they make them even stronger at that given dose. Depending on the drink and how you're consuming caffeine, there are some additives, some other chemicals, some other agents that can potentiate and strengthen the effect of caffeine and then increase the risk of you getting into these not so good areas. Toxic levels occur around 10 grams or 10,000 milligrams per day. We generally see this from caffeine containing meds, right? Where you're taking pills rather than caffeinated food or caffeinated beverages. If you co-consume caffeine with other stimulants, as an example, nicotine, or even with alcohol, it can have synergistic effects on caffeine. And again, you can reach those toxic levels at a lower dose. What's interesting is that with alcohol, caffeine tends to suppress the depressive effects of alcohol. So when people are drinking alcohol and caffeine at the same time, they tend to increase their alcohol consumption. And there are data to suggest that higher levels of chronic caffeine consumption are associated with greater levels of anxiety and mood disorders. Okay, the best part. What are the different types of caffeinated beverages and the pros and cons of each? And why do I think tea is the best one? First of all, let's start with coffee. Coffee is the most popular beverage in the world after obviously water. The world drinks 1.6 billion cups of coffee per day. Caffeine content is gonna vary based on the type of coffee as well as the specific brewing method. You can expect it to be usually within the range of 90 to 120 milligrams for every three quarters cup. That's 180 milliliters. With an espresso, it's normally 65 to 75 milligrams of caffeine per shot. And if you go to Starbucks, you get one of their grandes or ventis that usually has two shots to so bring up the total to around 150 milligrams of caffeine. Now, as for the good about coffee, it contains higher levels of phenols, which are known to have strong antioxidant properties, which combat some of the negative effects of caffeine, things like glucose metabolism or inflammatory pathway or just overall homeostasis. And research supports that coffee may help prevent inflammatory and oxidative stress-related diseases, things like obesity, metabolic syndrome, and type two diabetes. Now, as for the bad, it has higher caffeine content compared to other caffeinated drinks like tea, which could be a good or bad thing depending on where you stand. And it can also cause GI ups in some people. All right, on to tea. Actually, I'll be right back. Now, as for tea, all tea, true tea, not herbal tea, comes from the plant Camellia sinensis. And we have white, green, oolong, black, and pu'er. Now, white is the least processed, green is non-oxidized, oolongs are semi-oxidized, black is fully oxidized, and pu'er is aged and fermented. Now, the interesting thing is that by dry weight, Tea actually contains more caffeine than coffee, but we just tend to use less of it in each of our drinks. You're gonna expect the range to be anywhere from 10 milligrams up to 70 milligrams for every three quarter cup or 180 milliliters. And this will of course depend on a lot of factors, the type of tea you use, how much you use, and the steeping time. Now there's a lot of good with tea. Tea has high levels of polyphenolic compounds, including catechins, which have very strong antioxidant activity. It also contains L-theanine, an amino acid, which improves mood and reduces anxiety and stress. So compared to coffee, which can sometimes give you that jittery, wired feeling, you get a more calm, focused, almost zen state with tea. Now there are over a thousand publications in the scientific literature that report some cancer reducing properties of tea. So they find decreased rates of skin cancer, including both squamous cell and melanoma, prostate cancer, lung cancer in both smokers and non-smokers, breast cancer, both with prevention as well as recurrence, esophageal cancer, colorectal cancer, liver cancer, and pancreatic cancer. Tea has also been associated with decreased cardiovascular risk. So both in terms of strokes as well as coronary artery disease. And they think it's because catechins prevented the appearance of atherosclerotic plaques as well as reduce the absorption of both triglycerides and cholesterol. It's also associated with decreased risk of type 2 diabetes, arthritis, and rheumatoid arthritis. Now as for the bad, tea does contain tannins, which are antioxidants, but they also reduce the bioavailability of iron. So that means if you have too much tea and you have too much tannins, you increase your risk of iron deficiency anemia. So if someone has issues with anemia, then they should generally be more mindful of their tea consumption. Next up is soda, and the amount of caffeine usually ranges from 20 to 70 milligrams per a 12 ounce serving. As for the good, there really isn't anything. As for the bad, soda contains a large amount of sugar. And not only is that gonna cause you to crash harder than if you didn't have any sugar at all, but you also increase your risk of obesity and type two diabetes. There are sugar-free options that contain artificial sweeteners. And sometimes these do cause GI upset, but generally speaking, they're gonna be a better option compared to having the full sugar alternative. Next up, energy drinks. And the amount of caffeine is gonna range from 80 to 350 milligrams per serving. 
As an example, a mini can of Red Bull is less than 80 grams, but one can of Bang has over 350. Now, as for the bad, a lot of these energy drinks contain guarana, which increases your heart rate. It has that positive chronotropic effect and also potentiates the inotropic effect of caffeine, meaning your heart beats harder each time. They also tend to include large amounts of sugar, which is obviously not ideal. And because they have so much caffeine, it becomes very easy to overconsume caffeine. And last up, pre-workout drinks. These usually range between 150 and 300 milligrams per serving. The issue here is that surveys have demonstrated a lot of users of pre-workout supplements, they use more than one serving per use. They also tend to use it multiple times per day. And, and one third of respondents actually reported using pre-workout supplements with other caffeinated beverages. The good is that research demonstrates that caffeine and these pre-workout supplements does improve athletic performance. But as for the bad, again, it has a higher dose of caffeine, plus people tend to use too much of it, too many servings, or they use it with other caffeine containing products. That means higher risk of caffeine adverse effects. There's also a lot of variability in terms of the ingredients and compounds that they put into each pre-workout. And because it's a supplement, it's not regulated by the FDA. They still need to disclose the names of the various ingredients, but not the amounts of each. So you could be overdosing or underdosing. You're not sure if you're getting the right amount of these various compounds, including caffeine. And the compounds that they most commonly use are not only caffeine, but also creatine, beta alanine, taurine, amino acids, and nitric oxide agents. But because of this supplement loophole, at least here in the United States, you could be getting a safe ingredient at too high of a dose, which therefore makes it unsafe, or just a totally different ingredient that isn't safe at all. And the other thing to keep in mind is that there isn't a lot of research in terms of long-term supplementation with pre-workouts. All right, guys, that's it for this video. Hopefully you understand a little bit more about caffeine and why tea is my go-to drink of choice. If you wanna learn how to make amazing loose leaf tea, not the nasty tea bag stuff that most of us know about, then check out this video or check out this one. Much love and I'll see you guys there.